Good morning, class. Good morning. Well, we have a rare treat of Ed with us this morning, so I'm going to put Ed on the spot. Would you mind opening us up, up in a word of prayer? We'll get started. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day that you blessed us with. Thank you for the time that we have to gather together and learn more about your word. We pray that we absorb the knowledge we obtained here today and we go out in the world and serve you in the way that you want us to serve you and lead others to Christ, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us, but most of all for Jesus. It's in his blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, folks, we are just past the halfway point in our review of how we are to respond to the gospel. We've covered a lot of different things, breaking all these down into to smaller bite-sized pieces. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about the gospel itself, uh, what that's composed of, and it's, it's smaller pieces where atoned for our guilt and God's wrath is taken out of the way. We are justified. We have been declared righteous before God uh, based on the perfect finished work of Jesus and not on ourselves. Uh, we are sanctified and being sanctified where God is working in us to conform us to the image of his son. We are doing this not from arm's length, but as dear children of God. We have been adopted into the family of God, and we're looking forward to that great promise that he has uh, made for us that we will one day be glorified where this, this body of corruption will once and for all be put off. We will inherit incorruptibility uh, and perfection and dwell with him and all those wonderful things. And so then we ask the question, okay, well, what do we do with that? How are we to respond to that information, that presentation of the gospel? And that's where this series has picked up. And the first thing we discussed was we need to be uh, hearing the gospel. It's not just a one and done thing, but we're actively, continually exposing ourselves to the message of the gospel. What is true about God, what's true about ourselves, that sort of a thing. Uh, and when we hear, that hearing should produce something in us. This comes by hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. What is the this we're after? Faith. Faith or belief. It's, it's that uh, that transition from just the words coming up to your head and your heart, but actually being incorporated into your life. We want to believe, and we know that we believe when these three things uh, start to produce some fruit. What are these three things? All right. Not everybody at once. What, what does belief bear its fruit in? It, it starts up here in our, in our heads, right? We're going to think differently. We're going to try and adopt the mindset of Christ. But we don't just think differently. What else should change? Our hearts. How we feel. The seat of our emotions. And when our head and our hearts are converted as we're believing um, what God says is true through the gospel, that's going to affect something else. What you do with your hands. Your head, your heart, and your hands will bear the fruit of that gospel message being received, heard, and believed. All right, if that's all true, that's going to lead to what we talked about last week. And that is our confession, or rather our confessing. It's an ongoing practice, as we've said about each of these things, not just a one and done. And so what are some of the, the key things that we are to be confessing on a regular, day-to-day, all-the-time kind of a basis? Well, a practice of discipleship. Okay, that is it is a practice. Confessing is a practice of discipleship. What are what are some key truths that we need to be confessing each week? And it's it's on your handouts and it's up on the screen. Jesus. Jesus, all right. What about it? Who he is. Who he is. Who is Jesus? <clears throat> He's Lord and Christ. He is the sovereign ruler. He has all authority over my life and yours. That is a truth we confess to be true about Christ, uh, to be true about Jesus. He is also the Christ, meaning he is the one who was sent into the world to deal with yours and mine, our, our sin problem. We confess who Jesus is. And what else do we confess about the gospel? Who we are. Who we are. All right. Now there's good news, bad news. 
about what the gospel has to say about us. What's the good news side of it? You're in Christ. We're in Christ. And in Christ, I've been, what? Kay, I know you got it. Before you start to do the atone for, for justified, justified, sanctified, sanctified right? Adopted, 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 adopted. Exactly. Well, that's that's the good news of what we confess. We confess that Christ is Jesus is Lord in Christ. We confess that in Him I am all of these things. That stabilizes us and then enables us to confess that other thing, the not so good side. What's the reason that we need? The gospel. We got sin problems. We sin. And so that's that's where we're picking up here. Confession is a result of this hearing and believing. We confess who Christ is. We confess who we are, the good and the bad. And after that, this leads us to our topic for today. Repentance revisited. Now just like confession is a first fruit of the gospel... Repentance is also a first fruit of the gospel. They, you could argue about which comes first. I, I personally lean on the side that confession comes before repentance because why would you bother repenting if you didn't also confess what the gospel says is true about Christ and ourselves and all that. One would not repent apart from hearing and believing the gospel. Repentance is the next logical practice following confession. So there's a good passage that I think kind of sheds some light on what repentance produces in the life of a person who not only believes but confesses these things to be true. 2 Corinthians 10 or 7, 10 through 11. For godly grief produces what? Repentance. A repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Now here's the fruit of this repentance when we keep reading. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. How do we know that genuine repentance has occurred? You change. There, a change There's took a change. place, right? There's a change. And Paul lists a, a lot of those things, a lot of the changes that took place. What are a few of them? He says, For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. Earnestness as opposed to what? Not earnestness. I pick whatever vocab word you want. Not earnestness. Uh, eagerness. Yeah. To clear, to, to clear off all of there's a change has taken place. That's the bottom line. So, confessing who Jesus is and who we are in light of the gospel empowers us to first confess our sins to him. When we confess sins, we're not just informing the Lord of what we've done, but we confess to help affect change in our lives. Does God already know the wrongs that we've committed? Yep. Better than we do. He's not in the dark about the sins that we commit. Sins of commission or omission, out of ignorance. He, he knows all of it. He sees all of it. And so confession, as we talked about last week, is for our benefit. We're not informing him, but we are hoping to affect change in our own lives. And this change ultimately comes through this practice of repentance, what we just looked at in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. How do we know that these people were repentant and that change had occurred? Well, you see it. You see that they saw the sin, they confessed that it's true, and then they did things to overcome it or be rid of whatever those sinful things were. Yeah, Acts 2. Acts Peter, 2. Peter's sermon. Mm -hmm. They were touched in the heart. Yep. That, that's one of the things that we... Uh, that seem to be missing, but are implied in Acts chapter 2. It's all the... the like we, we know they heard it. Yeah, the Ethiopian right. eunuch was another one. Acts 8. Yeah. yeah. Who is this? Who is he talking about? And then when he explained it, hey, there's some more. Yep. 
So that was you don't you don't hear the confession, mm -hmm. but you see the fruit of it. Yep, that's right. It doesn't always you, you don't always see like in scripture somebody having an audible confession like in Acts chapter two. But Peter said, "This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ." They're pierced to their hearts. You don't see them saying, "Oh, I believe." You don't hear the scripture referring to them hearing anything. You don't even hear them making an audible confession. But we know that those things took place because they asked the question, "Okay, we we see something's wrong here. What, what do we do?" We do? Yeah. yeah. And then what does Peter say? Repent. Be baptized. All right. Terry? Fox and James look at him with perfect law of liberty. That's how they put know where you're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you when you look into the law of liberty, you you see the perfection of Christ, you look at scripture, uh, you're going to see where you don't measure up for one. But then also scripture doesn't leave you hanging. It, it tells you what the remedy is to whatever you see. So, very good. Any other comments or questions? What you got, Kay? Not. We talk a lot about what's the perfect law of liberty. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's a great question. Ten words or less. There's, well, it uh, says, you know, what, what does that mean? There are opinions because it doesn't come right out and tell you exactly what it is. Excuse me, what was the question I didn't have? What's the perfect, define perfect law of liberty. Me, the perfect law of liberty is, is, is the New Testament that you're looking into. That's one opinion. I, I'm just asking. There, we, some we people say, say it's time. some people say it? it's New Testament. Others believe it's Christ Himself. They look at Him as a mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, he is the New Testament. It, yes, but He's also the Old Testament. Yeah, but we're not under the old law. No, not under the old law. But the whole Old Testament isn't the old law. So, see, see how this, that's why there's a lot of opinions as to what is the perfect law of liberty. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yep. All right. That, that's a discussion for another, another time when I'm not teaching. Uh, all right. Let's, let's venture forward. So, when you see, especially in the New Testament, uh, when Christ is going through his earthly ministry, you see Jesus, John the Baptist, and others giving that command to repent. And what's almost always associated with that command to repent? That, that's, that's after. Confess. Right, I'm going to go to my notes. Here we go. Repentance is often just seen as a command of God associated with a warning of destruction. Repent or perish. If you do not repent, you will all likewise perish. Uh, John the Baptist, same message. Jesus, same message. Repentance with a, a stern warning of, it's coming. You need to do this. Okay. One of the things Jesus said, he said, the words I speak unto you this day will judge you in the last day. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> That's good. That's good to walk so Luke, Luke 13, 3, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There's a, there's a threat, and it's not an empty one, that uh, really highlights the need for repentance to take place. Repentance can certainly be an ultimatum, do it or else. Uh, even back in the Old Testament with Jonah, he's a great example of that. Same, same deal. He preached perhaps the shortest sermon ever that converted a whole nation. 40 days, or you're done. Like, that's, and they repented in sackcloth and ashes. There was a, a visible transformation that took place. And uh, so there is an ultimatum associated with it. Repentance is serious because our soul's well-being well hinges upon our repentance, whether it actually takes place or not. God takes it very seriously. We need to take it very seriously. Comments, questions? There's a, <clears throat> I've seen a couple of posts. One of them is, uh, I remember you when. Okay. You, you, 
profession to be a Christian. I remember you when. Yep. As well, I'm sorry. I don't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Or that man is gone. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you have to sometimes remind your <clears throat> friends who, you know, not anymore. A lot of times they just don't get it. But just don't get it. That could be an open door to walk into and say, "Let me tell you about something." Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good one. Well, that's. Uh, I think that would be called uh, witnessing or giving a testimony. Mm -hmm. That's sharing. And it's an open door to share your story. And actually, <laughs> Paul did that. He yeah. actually did that before a couple of different rulers was. Uh, Felix and Agrippa, uh -huh. both of them, he, he shared his story. Mm -hmm. Guys, I'm going up to Damascus, the road to Damascus here, and here's what happened. And you see a changed life afterwards. Was there a hand or am I imagining things? Terry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two. It's, it's not a laser pointer. Right? It's not one of these going across the floor. You got to stand in that, or or you're you're done for. Uh, it's, and then you, to me, then you throw out grace, blood, and everything else. If it's that. Yep. Yeah. That's true. So, remember the Lord's seriousness about a repentance. Though you see these warnings that are very stark, the the repent or perish type language of it. Remember that these, these warnings in the Lord's seriousness about repentance is a tender mercy towards us. Sometimes we might see that language and see, wow, he's really, wow, really? That's, that seems pretty strict. Why has he got to be so, so harsh about this? He didn't have to warn us about anything. He wasn't out obligated to, to give the warning at all. He would be just to just send everybody to hell. But he did. It's tender mercy that he gave warning. He's given us the truth of the matter, even though it might offend us. He's told us the truth of the seriousness of the situation. It's an extension of his love towards us that he, uh, it's not her, that he tells us to repent. And he commands us to repent because it's for our ultimate good. Go ahead, Terry. He's telling us how bad sin is. Mm -hmm. yep. Not to take it lightly. Right. Yep. Be killing sin at her own or it'll be killing you. It's it's serious, serious stuff. And he has loved us enough and been gracious towards us enough to say just how serious it is with these serious warnings about it. He proved that by what Christ did for us. So we've looked at, you know, we've looked at hearing, believing confessing. Mm -hmm. And those require a practice. Yes. The I and G makes it its present. Mm -hmm. Repentance. It's an it's an ING as well. Repenting. Repenting. <laughs> so it you know you make a mistake. <clears throat> That's where confessing comes in because then you're reviewing uh oh, what did I do today? Mm -hmm. Oh man. And then you realize it and then you you move on, but you try to you're uh, better prepared the next time that temptation shows up that you can battle it mm -hmm. because you don't want to fall into that same trap. That's that's the idea. You you ought to <clears throat> strive to grow through your repentance. And there's there's a couple things we'll get to that deal with that here a little bit. You have to be able to see the sin in your life. So mm -hmm. you yes. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. If you, you don't see it, you're not good. If you don't see it, you keep going. Yes. Yep. If you don't know there's something wrong, you're not going to pursue fixing it. Change it. Yeah. yeah. 
Repentance is the act whereby one turns from his or her sins, their idolatry, or their preacherly rebellion, and turns to God in faith. That's a fairly succinct but detailed anyway, definition of what repentance is. And I, I suspect that some of us might look at repentance kind of like we might for confession. You know, confession, you think of going to the priest and you know, airing out all your dirty laundry. It's not really something you want you to have to deal with. And repentance and confession go hand in hand. So there's a good chance that there are people out there who think of repentance as this overly negative thing that we want to try and avoid having to deal with at all costs. But really, repentance is a gracious invitation of the gospel to turn from something that does not give life, that fact takes it away, that's sin, and to the only one that can give you true life and lasting life, that is the Savior. It's an invitation for us to forsake the things that are killing us and cleave to the thing, the only thing, that can save us and give us true life. So it's actually something very beneficial, something to, to love and enjoy. There's a need for repentance. We all know what that is, because we all sin. Yeah. The need for repentance is not only universal, but ongoing. Because it's not like we just sin one time. We, we still sin, even now. Even as Christians, we continue to sin. This doesn't mean that you are actively sinning every single moment of your life. Maybe you are, I, I don't know. But most people are actively committing sin every single moment of their life. But there is always a need for this practice of repentance throughout your life. And so we want to know how to do that in a proper, healthy way that's beneficial to us. Got something, Terry? Yeah, I wanted to look it up. I remember a scripture that says, Repent and be baptized, and you'll be saved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's in 1 John. Uh, he no longer makes a practice of sin. I think it's 1 John. But uh, I, I'm familiar with what you're talking about, though. But if he does, yeah. because it says, it says uh, well, yeah. 1 John 1, 7 through 10, he talks about that. Mm -hmm. But then it, it says that if you're not, if you say you're not, a, if you say you're without sin, sin you're a liar. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so that's what that's what Paul was admonishing the Romans for because they figured, hey, we got all this grace. Yeah. Oh, let's keep sinning because the grace will abound. Right. We Darn. want more grace, so keep sinning. So yeah. you have more. Yeah. That's not. That's not it. Is. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Last I checked, all involves a whole lot of people. Uh, <laughs> sin is any word, thought, or deed that lacks conformity to the character or conduct of Christ, that fails to meet the standard of God's moral law, or fails to uphold his law, and that which breaches God's parameters for human activity in life and worship. So, you got all your bases covered. Uh, sin can touch every part of our life, and it, it, it does in some respect. There are different kinds of sins. Uh, James 4, 17, for whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. What kind of a sin is that? Commission or omission? Omission. omission. I knew what to do, and I said I'm not going to do it. It's a sin of omission. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's go back to that. Uh, James 4, 17. Mm -hmm. um, this particular scripture makes it individual mm -hmm. makes it an individual thing or a personal thing because it says for him mm -hmm. 
In other words, uh, if you go back to the Christian liberty, yep. and uh, eating meat sacrificed to idols, that doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. But I'll eat it. Ooh. But if your brother, he has a problem with it. Mm -hmm. And if he eats it, to him, it's a sin. Mm -hmm. So, um, he twists his arm into eating it, and then he does what's a right. what's against conscience. So again, it's yeah. a, it's an individual thing, mm -hmm. and uh, as a brother or sister in Christ, then if we know that that if, based on Christian liberties, if we know that that's going to cause a problem, mm -hmm. we won't either, mm -hmm. especially if we're eating together, or right. maybe they come in and there you are. Yep. Got any vegetables? <laughs> Got some vegetables. That's it. Sin is pervasive. It affects each one of us. It mm -hmm. seems to creep into virtually every part of our lives. It will always frustrate us on this side of heaven, so we need to know how to deal with it so that we're not overcome by it, that we don't become desensitized to it. That's a big problem. And so that we can uh, actually receive refreshment having overcome whatever sin we do face. What you hear, believe, and confess is going to greatly impact how you practice your repentance. As you hear, believe, and confess what the gospel says, you're going to become aware of sin in your life. We look into the law of liberty, perfect law of liberty. We're going to see the good, bad, and the ugly. And so we want to respond to that awareness of sin. As long as we're looking. As long as you keep looking, right? You want to respond to that awareness of sin in a specific way, but you might respond to it in several different ways. Isn't that where keep looking, be watchful, be vigilant? Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that, that applies here. Watch out, he's going to get you. So repentance can become a thing of refreshment if we practice it rightly. Let's say, all right, I'm, I become aware of my sin. And I'm going to try my best to just forget about it and bury it deep inside. Is that the proper response to the sin when we see it? Yeah. I see no. it, let's just bury it and forget about it. It'll, it'll go away? No. No. It won't go doesn't, away. Doesn't fix the problem. <laughs> what about this way? I'm aware of my sin, but I deny that, it really, that it's really sin at all, and I just deceive myself. Oh, trick. Bible says it's saying, well, I don't really think so. I mean, that's an old book. What do they know? They're ancient people. That could also be related to a sea of conscience. Sea of conscience, right? Not the proper way to, to deal with it. I'm aware of sin, and I will seek the restoration the gospel alone can give me as I learn to overcome it. Does that sound good? That's, that sounds probably the way to do it. In your handout, you've got uh, this visual and another one similar to it. I like visuals because that's kind of how I learn. Uh, both of them are basically saying the same thing, but just looking at it from two different, two different views. At the top, 12 o'clock, you see awareness of sin. And what you believe is going to impact what you confess. It's going to dictate how you respond. And you're going to either confess your sin or you're going to deny it. And from there, uh, other things will happen. You... Your confession will either drive you to repentance or your denial will drive you into excusing. If you deny your sin, you're going to make excuses for it. If you confess your sin, you're going to hopefully want to repent of that sin. And so from repentance or excusing, you move forward. And you're either going to go into refreshment or guilt. Your repentance will bear the fruit of refreshment when it's genuine. It really takes place. Or... Your excuses will leave you feeling guilty, or you'll just sear off that conscience completely. So after you have this season of refreshment, you're going to continue to grow in Christ. You'll become more and more aware of your sin in your life. And this is really part of your sanctification. You grow in your awareness. You deal with it appropriately. You repent of it. You change. You conform to Christ. And you have a season of refreshment. There's another a graphic that has it spelled out, probably a little bit more <clears throat> concisely, and you'll see it has this spiral pattern on it. And each time you go through this process where you become aware of sin and you confess it, repent, and all that, 
you're actually drawing closer to the center. And what's at the center of that graphic that you have? It's Christ. So you, you, we call this the sanctification cycle. You deal with these sin problems, and as you do, you're growing in conformity to Christ. You're becoming more and more like him over time. Does that make sense? Well, you can handle the temptations better. That's, that's the hope. Because you're already aware of that sin, a particular sin, existing in your life. And you genuinely repent of it. You're going to enjoy what comes from repentance more than the sin itself. That's, that's the hope. Overcoming. Overcoming. Yep. Comments or questions? I still being able to see it, identify it. That's that awareness. So where does the awareness come from? When you when you're pre when you're hearing the gospel every day, you're preaching it to yourself. You've developed that practice, and you're believing what the gospel says, and you're confessing who Christ is, who we are. We we are coming face to face every time we do that with how good Jesus is and the things that we're still not measuring up. Right? And we see the things we don't measure up on. What have we just become? We've become aware of sin or shortcomings that still exist with, within we're our always, lives. We're always going to have that. Yes. And we can have less. less. And what? I say we'll have less if we see it mm -hmm. and change. That, yes. We look into perfect law of liberty. We see who Jesus is. We see who we are. We see the places we don't measure up. We become aware of our sin. Let's say Jesus says that perfect love casts out all fear. Why am I so afraid to talk to my neighbor? Well, it's because I'm not believing something of what the gospel says is true. I've just become aware of sin. Let me finish. I've just become aware of sin. Can I confess, Lord, I'm I am afraid to talk to my neighbor because I don't trust you that you're going to do a work despite my lack of ability. Can we confess? Let me finish. Can we confess that sin? That's a sin. Yeah. Do we agree? That's sin? Sure. All right. We confess that sin to be true. We can do one of two things. What's the graphic say? We can either repent or we can excuse it. What are we going to do? If we repent, what does that look like? That means, all right, I might feel like a coward right now, but I'm not going to live like that anymore. And so despite how I might feel, I'm going to go talk to my neighbor. That's what repentance looks like. That's what a changed heart looks like. What comes when you've actually repented of that and you trust in the Lord, even though you're scared? You say, oh, that was rough, but we did it. Thank you, Lord, that you helped me in this. That's refreshment. Or you can say, it's just not for me. Somebody else can deal with that. I don't have what it takes. What have you done? You've made an excuse. <coughs> and then you're going to continue to feel guilty. I, I just can't. Can't do it. So that refreshment never comes. That's the ongoing process of sanctification. That's ongoing. the mirror effect. That's it. That's just one example. And so we, we want to practice, as we look into the gospel, what, is, what does Jesus say? Who is he? What are we? You know, When we continue to look into that, awareness is going to come around. And we have a decision to make. What are we going to do with the awareness of the sin we've just discovered? And you'll have successes and failures. But we want to continue on this, this journey round and round to get closer to Christ. Does that make sense? No, I've never said it's easy. But it's it's true. This, this is how it functions. All right. What are we doing on time? We we got to get moving. We got to get moving. Repentance becomes refreshment. We need to develop a practice of repentance as part of our ongoing sanctification. It's a practice. We we don't just we repent, get thrown in the water, come out, and then that's the end of it. It's a practice we need to do every day as we become more aware of our sin. Confess who Jesus is, who we are, and allow ourselves to confess our sins. We need to avoid excusing sin and instead recognize it and take steps to forsake it and grow past it. Not always easy. 
We need to trust God in the process and enjoy renewed fellowship with Him. It's out the, the refreshment, the renewed fellowship after having repented and gotten past it is our, ours to take. Repentance is also a privilege. <clears throat> we are freed from guilt and are blessed with renewed confidence in our salvation. God didn't have to do that for us, but he gives us that opportunity. Just, uh, I think it's one of the Peters that talks about he doesn't want anybody to perish, but to all to come, all to come mm -hmm. to repentance. He, he wants to give humanity, especially Christians, this mm -hmm. this opportunity to enjoy the fruit of repentance. Our confidence grows because we realize we did nothing to earn the forgiveness; we didn't merit it, but because we have grown in our reliance on God's power to save us through the gospel. It's a privilege because God has given us the opportunity. To repent when he was not obligated to do so. And we're going to call it quits there. Any last minute comments or questions? Go ahead, Terry. Exactly what I was going to say in March. It's one of all the world things about the don't have time to go down the rabbit hole as much as I want to. Why? Why is it so hard? And this is where the awareness comes in. What am I believing or not believing that is causing that difficulty in my life? We believe that he helps us, but he can change the pushing this to our Okay. How does he help us? Does the scripture say anything about that? Mm -hmm. But that's a big dog go most When we ask ask those questions, we say, here's a, we can identify the the problem in the big sense. I'm afraid to go talk to somebody. But then we gotta do that hard work of digging down into why am I afraid? And that's where the rubber's going to meet the road. Why am I afraid to go talk to somebody? Is it something about them? Is it something about me? Is it something I'm believing about God or not believing about Him? And those, those are questions that are unique to everybody's situation. But learning how to ask those questions, to be honest, to see what's really what, and then move past <coughs> there is, is hard work but necessary. Go ahead. See, when they came into the I don't care who you are. You got a captive audience, though. Yeah. And I know that there was other barbers who were talking about me because they knew what was going on in my shop. It was, you know, word of mouth was pretty quick. Then it bothered me. To be honest with you, I enjoyed it. It's good. Any other comments, questions? Good discussion this morning. All right, get a couple extra minutes. Let's get ready to worship.